Hey everybody, this is Mario Dennis, your host with the Keeping It Real Estate Podcast. And today I have my good friend Lisa Jones, who I want to do a very special introduction for. I got this letter, you know the one, where some big business offers to buy your house and tells you how easy they can make it. Well, I've looked into it, and that convenience comes with a cost. Not only do you risk leaving money on the table by selling under market value, but their costs are often higher than selling with a Realtor, and you could be asked to make costly and even unnecessary repairs. Before you lock in with them, call me. I'm Lisa Jones with Vantage Point Realty, and I'm here to help. Hey, Lisa. Hey. I love that commercial. Thanks. That's probably one of the best things that I've seen in, in terms of being able to speak truth to what's happening with this iBuyer guys. What inspired you to do it? They're here. They are taking up market share. Um, they are definitely something that we need to be concerned about. And I figured, how can I reach a bunch of people, being who I am, who is not a super social person, and get the message out there? And I figured commercial is the best way to go. Yeah, that's two things we have in common. The first is we're both pretty antisocial for our industry standards at least. Um, but but we're we're the ones that have been in the sort of spearhead of trying to talk about this eye buyer thing. And more importantly, just to try to educate the consumer about what exactly this looks like for them. Absolutely. You know, uh, the, it, in this day and age, there's so much information out there and people jump onto things pretty quickly and people really need to know what they risk to lose by going with a company like this. And it's not only the money, it's the lack of representation and having someone really in your corner fighting for you. Yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of things that are problematic about them, but probably the worst thing for the consumers that there's just not enough education about it yet. And in a world where they can basically infiltrate your phone and your um, your email and your mailbox without someone giving a counter argument, oftentimes people end up with a sort of a very monolithic argument of what it is that they are. And they're really good at painting a pretty picture too. You know, they, the things that they put out there and, and what they present, uh, you know, if someone doesn't take a second look, they can look at those comps and say, hey, this is what it is. But, you know, you know, as well as I know that we can cherry pick whatever we want and make the numbers reflect what we'd like to see. Um, normally, I start out with an introduction, but obviously the commercial took us in a different way. Um, you are the broker owner of Vantage Point Realty and you guys are in Claremont and Mineola, right? Uh Claremont is where our company is located, but uh, the business runs anywhere from Seminole to Lake to Polk and all over. Very good. Orange. Um, wh what made you want to be an independent brokerage? After almost 10 years of working for other people, um, the last company I worked at, we'll call it Big Red, I was a big red for a number of years, and um, I took a leadership role in the company, uh, being on the leadership committee. And one of the things that I noticed kind of consistently happening with companies is their mission statement really didn't match their core values. And you don't really see that until you're in it. And, um, you know, I was getting a little overwhelmed with, with uh, office life, so I started working from home. And every time I'd go into the office, there were always these fresh faces and new faces. And it's like, who's this? Who's that? Who's that? And it was all about numbers for them. And um, <clears throat> I'm not about numbers. I'm about doing the right thing, taking care of people, making sure what you say and what you do actually align. And I realized after, um, you know, 10 years of working for other people that the only real way that the mission statement is going to align as if it's my mission statement. Um, you know, um, I, it just office politics. I have no tolerance for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me because oftentimes these companies have what you would call like really strong culture. They pride themselves on them. But one of the things that's interesting to me, particularly with a franchise model is that even within the same flag, if you go into different offices across the country or even across the, the area, it's a completely different vibe. 
because each office, even though they have the same sort of like name on the door, they, they're they very um, specific in how they want to run things. And there are some that are better at it to, you know, stick into that core value in the mission statement. And there are some that deviate from it some more. Um, it's one of those things about the franchise model that I don't think people get. People think it's like McDonald's. So you're going to get the same burger no matter which McDonald's you go into. No, absolutely not. And, uh, you know, th- I, there's a lot of good things that I could say about that company. But, you know, towards the end, I just felt like a number. And at that point, I was their top producing single agent. And, you know, the only time I heard from my, my team leader was uh, when there was an all call. Hey, everybody, come on out to this. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the thing that... that I think that's the thing that every agent gets turned off by at some point in their career. And is that that part where you start being used as a tool for other services or classes or whatever to be sold. You know, if you're only hearing from your team leader or or office manager, you know, when they're like, hey, there's this new class coming in town that we're trying to get eight people to pay six, seven, eight hundred dollars or whatever the case might be. Do you mind standing up on the sales meeting and telling them how great it was that last time that you went? Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll do that infomercial for you. But then it's it gets a little bit weird when that's the only time you hear from them. Like there's nothing in between. Like I don't mind doing your little infomercial if that helps you. But, but geez, like, let's have a little bit more of a personal touch in between those moments, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm really an independent person. I, um, I work really well independently, and, you know, I don't need a ton of stroking. Uh, but every once in a while... You're in the wrong industry. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you just say that, because I, I always say that that's one of the main reasons, you know, the big brands survive. There's people that just absolutely need that and i'm not saying there's anything i'm not trying to this is not um I, i'm not trying to say there's something wrong with that but but certainly if you're not the type that needs all the stroking then it's it's a difficult environment to navigate sometimes it can be it can be um what when you went on your own what are some of the better the changes that you noticed right away that made you excited for your decision to go on your own Oh, that's a tough one, Mario. Um, honestly, when I when I made the leap and and did it, you know, the, the the excitement was really in the novelty of it all. But I also learned a lot about myself in that process. Um, you know, that there's still a ton that I need to learn, um, including you know how to be a broker and um, you know the best management practices for people. Um, I myself am a very direct to the point person. Uh, not a whole lot of fluff. Uh, very few words used. And, um, you know, um, just like working with customers or anybody else, you need to learn how to tailor the way you talk to the to the people that you're working with. And, um, you know, that that's something that fortunately I've been able to, um, you know, hone in on and improve on a bit over the past couple of years. It's, it really kind of amazes me how I can be so fluid and smooth with customers uh, but in other in other aspects of my life, not so much. And I think it, it, it comes to it's part of the fact that um, when you know people a little bit better, you can you know be a little bit more relaxed. Sure. And you know not have to put on that full business face. Yeah, that's one thing that you and I have in common is we have that very direct personality. And I was really worried that this was going to be a four minute podcast. <laughs> no shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> Because we, you know, we have a lot of conversations, but generally, like, there's not a lot of storytelling. There, like, fact, 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 fact. Conclusion, close. You yeah. know, like, um, and so I was like, man, I hope w- we are at eight minutes, so we're already Woo-hoo! twice as long as I thought we were going to be doing this for. Uh, but you're a fascinating person to um, to talk to because because you're direct, and so I, I really crave that in this industry. And that's the, that's the reason why I'm not a good office person. The reason why I'm not a good person for the office in general, it's because I can't do the fluff. I just can't do it. And, and there's been points of my life where I was a little better at it, but, but I, I, I'm definitely turned off by it now. So working independently works really well for me. And thankfully we're in an industry that allows us to do that. Um, because my goodness, I, I, if I have to turn down another event, another social event, I, you know, you know, I always, I always equated walking around the office in a mega brokerage as 
being online in 2002 without a pop-up blocker. It was like you're walking the hallways and it's like, hey, there's this new class. Hey, there's this new system. Hey, there is this new trip. Hey, there's this new event. Hey, like you're like, geez, like calm down. Yep, and then it's, office gossip and chit chat in between. Yeah, it's it, it becomes really overwhelming if you're not the personality type that gets recharged with other people's energy for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely, and especially because you know I, I always got an early start to the day. You know, I would be in the office at eight o'clock, and I'd probably be winding up around ten, or you know, and then people would start coming in, and I found my days at the office were getting longer and longer, and I wasn't really getting anything more done. So, really, what was the point of doing that? And, um, you know, one of the things that I did with the office that I have, we've got a physical location. And it's, a, it's a cozy, tidy spot. But honestly, I'm never there. Um, it's a place for you to land. And if you're meeting with people or, you know, meeting with each other because, you know, uh, yeah. Are your, fluff fluff uh, is a time killer. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are your agents um, using this space more than you? Is that kind of the train of thought too? No, not so much. Because, no. uh, you know, my, my you know, if, if you don't have to work there, you, like who doesn't want to work from home with a cat on their lap? Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you're not showing properties, if you're not out at listing appointments, what's the point in being, being there really? When you can be somewhere more comfortable today's day and age, you can work from anywhere. Yeah. Not only can you work from a- anywhere, but... One of the big grabs, I think, or one of the big pitches for offices has always been the trainings and, and, and that sort of thing, the education and training part of it. But you can do that online as well very comfortably. You can go to the board if you, so, you, know, if you crave the training at the board. You can go do that. But it's funny because I was talking with an agent very young. She's 24, and she's like, oh, yeah, I have this, this YouTube library of all the training videos that she's seen. She has, like, 200 videos on this training. So she's basically done, like, Tom Ferry, that everything that you can think of, that you know, sort of like Main Street real estate training, she's seen it all because she looked it up in YouTube and it's there in front of her. And so it, it, saves, it saves the driving to somewhere to have to do that. That reminds me of when I first started my very first office. Um, they didn't have a whole lot of training. Um, I, I really wonder where my uh, career would have gone, actually, if I had real training mm-hmm. at the beginning. Holy shit. Um, but, uh, yeah, he had a library of Mike Ferry VHS tapes. <laughs> and he said, hey, watch these. There's someone listening to this now that doesn't know what a VHS is. Right? But uh, I took one. I took it home. I watched it. I watched it, like, two or three times, and I started door knocking. And, uh, you know, I could have had my first listing, like, within a week. This was so ironic. I, I was in Quail Valley, went down to the very last house on the street, knocked on the door. She's like, I'm with someone right now, but I really do want to talk to you. Can you come back another time? We set an appointment. Lo and behold, she was actually in a listing appointment with another agent. Wow. I would have gotten the listing, but I freaking listened to Mike Ferry, and I wanted her to list it 10% under market value. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, so sometimes uh, the best advice is to follow your gut, not what yes. someone else is telling you. Yes. Especially the guy that hasn't sold real estate. I don't think he's ever sold real estate. I think he's just a trainer, right? I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, but, uh, but yeah that, that, that was funny. That was um, so, you know, we started the podcast talk, listening to your um, commercial for iBuyers. But I wanted to hear your take more in, you know, first, you know, we can do a deeper dive into specifics, but... What's your overall thoughts on the general state of our industry? Uh, I think we're in a little bit of trouble um, between the iBuyers and, um, you know, the state of real estate as it is today. Um, We've always had an issue with people, um, you know, not really uh, taking pride in the work that they do or being serious about the work that they do or or being really ethical about the work that they do. And, you know, in, in all honesty, in my opinion, if you're doing it right, I really do believe that real estate can be a really noble profession because we are helping people achieve something major, one of the most major things in their life. We're helping people achieve that. And um, there's a lot of people that, that put it down to, you know, making the money or cutting corners and not doing things right, not being professional. And, um, you know, that, that hurts us as a whole. And um, I think with, with um, you know, social media and the Internet, um, you know, those, those types of stories spread faster and wider. 
and um, and they, they they really hurt us as a whole. And you know, it also creates infighting within the, within the industry. And I think what we need in this industry more than ever is people coming together and different companies working together towards the same cause, which is you know bringing the profesh- bringing the profession into um, you know making it look more professional to the general public and within the industry ourselves. You know, you see on the the the, uh, the social media posts where people are like bashing each other left and right. It's like what the fuck? You know, we're all working here. To, to, to do the same thing, achieve the same goals, let's work together, let's teach each other where we can, let's lift each other up, and, and, and you know, I don't know, I guess I'm a bit of an idealist. I know I'm a bit of an idealist, but... Yeah, I think, I, and I agree with, with all of that. I think someone that would disagree with you playing devil's advocate would, would say... Oftentimes, because it's gotten to a point where I think what happens is there's there's sort of a critical mass moment where, you know, you have the good professional agents and you, you know, you have the bad agents and you can use that in any profession. You can have the good plumbers and the bad plumbers or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think what we're seeing in real estate is that that balance seems to be tipping a little bit where, you know, you have really good agents, but if you go by the number of licensees themselves, um, there is a lot of people that have only been in the industry for a little while that they go into companies that are warehousing licenses by the hundreds, if not the thousands, um, and they're setting them loose on the streets, which has been one of the, the it's been one of the, the, the rare, the, the craziest thing for me to kind of come to terms in this industry is that someone can get the real estate license without ever looking at a purchase contract and they can sell real estate legally the next day. It is completely mind boggling. And I realize, you know, in the states, you know, that there's the broker structure, which is supposed to um, make that a little bit better because allegedly the broker is supposed to be overseeing the activities of that agent, but that we, we know that that's not happening. Um, so someone would say like, you know, if we don't start, like, I think there's a difference between general, like real critique and bashing. And so I think bashing is what a lot of companies do to each other to increase their agent count which I think that's a little bit silly because there's this race for agent count. So they bash each other, you know, like our pyramid scheme is better than your pyramid scheme, you know? So like they're bashing like specific. I've never heard you say that before. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, so I think that qualifies as that, but then there's general critique and you know, there's two sides to that coin. Like, do we just stay quiet because we don't want to like make ripples or do we, you know, or do we start pointing the finger and being like, hey, man, you're not doing the right thing here? Absolutely. You know, I, uh, I'm i not afraid of conflict by any means. Sure. And I'm more than happy to stand up when, when it's time to stand up and do something. And, and we, actu- uh, we absolutely do need to do something. Um, we don't do enough self-policing. We, um, I miss, there used to be a day way back when, when um, Aura in their magazine would list everybody that was um, fined for infractions. You know, I think that needs to come back. And, and uh, you know, we do need to call each other out when, when we're, we're, we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. And not only do we need to call each other out, but we need to be able to, to be honest and put our egos aside and say, hey, man, you know, you're right. I did do that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to do it differently next time. I appreciate you. Yeah, that's the humbleness part that's sometimes hard to find. Generally in society, I don't think that's an industry-specific issue. But but that's the other part of it that it almost seems because everyone retreats to this tribal mentality, like I have the red flag, I have the blue flag, I have the you know whatever flag within the industry. There's this sort of tribal mentality that anyone... Anytime someone is being con- giving you constructive criticism on, of any type, it's always taken as a personal attack, which is, uh, you know, another thing that doesn't help us for sure. No, but uh, and you hit the nail on the head too. You know, um, I'm a I'm a very small brokerage, and I don't plan on being anything humongous. Um, I'd love to look like I'm big, but be small. That's my ultimate goal. Um, but because I'm a broker and I care and I actually want to be able to look over the people that I'm with and make sure that they're doing right things and 
be sure they're representing the name in the right fashion. When, when you've got a brokerage where you've got 200 agents, there's nobody looking, you know, nobody really looking over what, what you're doing. If, for example, look at all these friggin' Facebook business pages. No brokerage name. You don't know who they are, you know, like, oh, South Lake Community. Well, it's this realtor trying to sell these houses. There's, you know, people need to be called out on it, and it's just not happening. Yeah, it's funny because um, last year at some point I got a call from, you know, I'm with the board in Lake County, and I got a call for, well, for uh, somebody complained of a violation that wasn't a violation, but they, they made the phone call anyways. And as I'm talking to them, they were they were seemingly very overwhelmed by the volume of people calling to complain about things. But a lot of it apparently was very baseless and very trivial. So there isn't one of the things that, that I think needs to be improved upon is the process in which um, complaints and violations are able to be submitted. Like it's 2019. I should be able to go as a member of my board to a website and be able to submit a complaint with a picture of whatever it is that I believe is the ethics violation. And there should be consequences not only to the person if they indeed violate it, but to the person that's reporting it if it wasn't a violation. Like I think that person needs to, you know, like if you submit a violation that's not really a violation, you should have to do like a three hour refresher course and ethics just so that you're not you a know. dummy and do this again. Um, but I think that's one of the systems that needs to be improved upon because if people are just making phone calls and expecting them to call and address this one by one, it's just too overwhelming. There's too many of us. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, we pay these dues and uh, we really don't get a whole lot out of it. You know, um, we, our NAR, our Aura, our Ralsk, um, Oscar, these people, you know, they should have the staff there to, to kind of review these things and, and, you know, pass them along if they need to be passed along. Or DBPR, you know, they should have the staff. God knows we, we spend enough every year. To, and, and there's so 187,000 realtors in Florida. Like, we can't have... At least one billion. You know? There's at least a billion of us in Florida, as far as I'm concerned. But, you um, know, we've got to have some compliance. Yeah, we have to have compliance. I think, you know, part of what you were talking about, I think it's really important in that I've talked about this before, and I, I like to get everybody stake, specifically broker owners, because... I don't think there's any possible way for one broker to be able, you know, to manage a thousand agents. I don't think there's any possible way for a broker to manage 500 agents. There has to be a number because when the state of Florida created this, there was no internet, there was no virtual offices. When they created this, it was kind of understood that you had to have space to house every one of those people in your building, which meant there was sort of like a restriction to the amount of agents one broker could have in the way of physical limitations. Because unless you had something the size of Walmart, you could only happen to have 15 or 20 agents at a time. Um, how many agents do you think a broker can responsibly handle? I really think that depends on the agent uh, or the broker because, um, you know, uh, agents can handle... You know, some agents can only handle four transactions at a time. Some can handle six. You know, some can handle more. You know, um, my best year, it, it, in today's standards, it's not a whole lot, but I sold $9 million and I did that all by myself without any any help as far as having, you know, a transaction coordinator or an assistant or any of that. And I handled it well. So it, it really comes down to who the person is and how they are with time management and actually staying focused and doing things and Today, it's a little harder to stay focused with everything that we're distracted by, but I think it really depends on, on who the broker is and, and how focused they are on the business and, and you know, how, how hands-on they are. Yeah, and also the type of agent that they have, Yeah, which I think it's part of what creates the problem because no one has an answer to that question. But what it, the problem that it creates is that then you have people that just use that, the fact that there is not a guideline for this to have 4,000 agents under one broker or however many, you know, insert in the blank, whatever outrageous number yeah. number of agents. And so I think, I think the state needs to be a little more serious about this and a little bit more serious about the, the ability people have to get licensed and go on the street and sell real estate right now without having supervision. Like you have to be realistic about 
what the market's doing. Like, you know, yes, it's not supposed to happen that way, but but it does. So I think, you know, I think one of the things that I've, I've always talked about is I wish we had a system of apprenticeship. So where an agent could not sell real estate on their own till they hit some thresholds, Mm -hmm. you know, of goals, you know, just like an appraiser, appraiser, I believe appraisers work in the same fashion. I don't know if it's a number of appraisals or time licensed or whatever, but they're under apprenticeship for X number of times, which means that the other person has to physically sign on their work, um, which I think would make it a heck of a lot better for the consumer. More than likely. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, People are flying by the seat of their pants and, you know, getting a lot of these brokerages, as long as the paperwork's compliant, that's all they really care about. Yeah. And if it's not compliant, what, another another one of the things is that, uh, you know, one of the things that you notice in real estate is if there's an escrow deposit dispute, generally cost more money to, you know, to fight for it than to just come to an amicable resolution. Uh, when someone does out something outside of the scope of the contract, um, it costs more to chase them than it does to just start fresh. You know, like mm-hmm. the, the the real estate contract, you know, it's a contract like any contract with built-in consequences and so forth. Um, but I don't think agents are that scared to make mistakes on it um, because it doesn't seem like there is enough severe consequences when they do. Like, listen, I just had this happen last week. I had a closing that was supposed to be on Friday. It was a cash transaction and the buyer and the agent and the agent and the buyer's attorney all ghosted me all day Friday, didn't show up to closing all day Monday, Tuesday at 5 p.m. They send some signed documents to the title company. Wednesday, a wire shows up five days after closing. I never really got a reasoning or an understanding about it. They did lie quite a, you know, they, they, they produced some lies between that Monday and Wednesday. Not that many though. Um, but there's no consequence for that to that agent. There's no consequence to that, to that broker. Like it, it, we were just happy that we closed on Wednesday. My seller was happy that he closed on Wednesday. He's not going to pursue anything else, you know, but just people defaulted on their contract. And it's just one of those things like agents looking at that in the office are like, eh, it's not that serious. But it is. It should be. It, it, yeah, it should be. And it is. And, and, you know, me personally, it's not even a, it's, well, it is about the default part, but, that's my name, you know, that, that's, so yeah, there's people out there that don't like me because they think I did things that probably they didn't agree with, but guess what? These are things that can be done, but, um, you know, everybody has people that, that don't like them, but if, if you're doing things right for the right reasons, then everything should, should go fine, but I'm kind of rambling now but the long and short of it is i care how that and you care how that transaction ends up because it's your name of course it, at the end of the day it's your name it's 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 your reputation it's who you are and i'm sure that your clients were happy to have you in the corner because i'm sure you were kind of fighting to the nail to the end not as much as i was happy to have them because it was the perfect seller for this to happen to because they are the nicest people most understanding people on the planet so i was happy I was very happy that this was with them. I told them, I'm like, listen, I know you are not going to understand this, but if this ever happens to me again, I hope it's with you guys again, because they were super understanding. But my point is like, that is an egregious problem. Like people moved, people moved stuff. Like people were in, you know, there's people's life on the line. And in the end, like, no, you know, like th- there's just not a whole lot of consequence. There's, there's nothing that happens and other agents bear witness of it. And it becomes this sort of like snowball that goes, you know, keeps rolling down. You know, we just had another one with an escrow problem, you know, like we had a contract where we have the seller and it's three days for escrow and six days later, six days later, there's no escrow. And the broker owner of the company, which is a large company, it's berating me because I'm re- saying Just that my, se- because I'm, because I'm telling him my seller is wanting to cancel this because he doesn't have any faith that their buyer are going to go forward with the transaction. And there's no apology. There is no, I'm sorry. There is no, you know, we're trying our best. There is like, fuck you. You know, I'm going to tell you how it is. You want to go find another, but go find it. Like, I'm like, why are you being defiant about this? But that's, that's sometimes what we run into. 
and it is sometimes, and usually those are the kind of people that don't like me because I'm just doing my job following up, trying to get answers. And, sure. you know, you're going to get pissed off at me because I'm just trying to make sure that things are getting done. Like, you know, we agreed to these things as timelines, as deadlines. You agreed to do this. What the hell? You know, of course, you know, six days later you, with the escrow, well, you haven't even performed. Right. Fuck you, dude. Yeah. Sign the yeah. fucking cancellation. Yeah. Well, Let instead, instead, else. instead, he's sick, his attorneys. You know, like it, it's just absurd. And then, you, then you know, in this specific case, it was extra hilarious because I'm like, the lawyers are watching all of this. I'm not a lawyer, but I know he's wrong. Like, I know he's very wrong about this. And the lawyers are just bearing witness to it. No one is being like, hey, dummy, just stay quiet. Just don't say anything. Let's try to produce this escrow. Let's, you know, let's... Yeah. Because listen, if someone gives me a reasonable explanation, even if it's not that reasonable, but I I feel there's some genuineness genuineness behind their words, I'm I'm fine with it. If you come to me and you say, "Listen, we totally forgot to send the wire instructions to the buyer. It's not his fault. Please don't penalize him for our. You know, we we're gonna get it done today or whatever." I'll be like, "Okay, cool." But if you're just like your default is to insult the other agent whom you have to cooperate to try to get this deal done. It's just mind blowing to me that it happens even once, but you know, it happens 20% of the transactions at least. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it does happen once in a while, but I, I luckily been fortunate um, throughout my career. There's only been like two or three deals where um, it's just absolute hell working with the other agent or, you know, e well, the clients, I just fire them. But, you know, working with hellish agents is, is one of the worst things possible because, uh, you're again, we're supposed to be working together towards the same goal, just like you. Like, like if, oh, you know, our dog died. I was really, you know, I was really, you know, out of sorts or whatever. That. Yeah. You know, this is what happened. OK, yeah, fine. You know, because there's, there's always a reasonable explanation. Well, there, there, you know, there's reasonable explanations for things and we're human. Shit happens. Yeah. What what would be a piece of advice that you would give a new agent that's trying to get into the industry now? And let me get you closer to that, Mike. Oh, I'm sliding. Piece of advice for a new agent is, uh, you know, be consistent. Find the thing that works for you and do it every day. You know, whether it's knocking on doors, cold calling, throwing a bun bunch of money into to buying leads or whatever, you know, make sure you're doing it every day and being consistent because the only way to really survive in, in, in this industry is to be consistent and uh, work it like a business and do what works for you. You know, if, if you're cold calling people for four hours a day and you can't stand it, the person on the other line is definitely going to know that, you know. So you got to do what works for you because there's like 18 different ways to, to get things done. Sure. And switching gears a little bit back into the iBuyer thing, can you tell me like a little bit of your overall thoughts? Um, just where do you see this going? What do you think should be happening right now? What, what, what can agents be doing right now to... Um, to try to minimize the losses that sellers are seeing because there is genuine losses so far as I'm concerned. Well, I think, you know, agents as a whole, again, need to band together. Uh, but until that happens, we need to, as individuals, do everything that we can within our power to, to help educate the consumer and, and let them know what's happening and, and what they stand to lose by, by going this route. Um, you know, granted, yes, this is something that, that could work for some people that are in dire situations and need to do something fast. Um, but, you know, also a realtor could, could help in a dire situation and make something happen fast, too, and probably get them some more money as well. So I think it it's really comes down to, you know, educating the com consumer. And you had said something the other day. Um, you know, you're walking into a listing appointment. Hey, do you have any offers on the house yet? Well, let's see what this is and let's see how this works because – um, you know, they might not always tell you. I've been, <clears throat> I've been fortunate with people that I've listed their properties with that have had those offers. They let me know up front, which was really nice. Um, but that's not going to happen in every case because you're not going to be referred to every, every seller. Yeah, and you, yeah, I, I, it's my personal approach to just lift the veil right off the bat. Like, 
this idea of trying to feel out a seller to see if it, does he know what an eye buyer is? Has he heard from them? Does he have an offer? Like you have to assume that you, they have. It's like that's what you I live do. in Florida. There's a body of water. There's an alligator in it. Correct. These companies are the alligators. You have to assume that they perfect. know. Yeah, that's a perfect analogy to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta I gotta figure out how to make that into a meme now. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's one of those things you, you just gotta operate under the assumption that they have it. And listen, there's a lot of things that I don't like about iBuyers, but there's a lot of things that I admire. One thing that I admire is the capacity to create marketing that gets into people's household. Oh, absolutely. Because men can they do that very well? Absolutely, they they are really good at uh, our marketing, and um, you know, unfortunately, um, our board is really good at different type of marketing, but it, it's not anything that actually, again, truly serves us. Um, so we as the individuals, we as the brokerages, you know, we need to stand up and, and educate and do do the, do everything that we can with the resources that we have to make sure that people know the true story or the full story of what these companies um, are offering. Yeah, I think the part where it's starting to get more squarely as time goes on is that Banding together, obviously, is, seems like the logical answer here. Um, but now there, it's become a more nuanced solution because now you have big companies and agents in, in business with iBuyers, and it just kind of creates uh, a, another layer to the complexity of how to handle it because now... You know, there is agents that have a genuine, you know, financial and business interest in the well-being of iBuyers. And then that, to me personally, that flies on the face of everything that I know about how to perform my job. And it's just it's just getting a little complex to navigate so far as I'm concerned. You know, as far as that that whole thing goes, that just blows me away. Um, you know, I remember a few years ago, probably more than a few years ago, um, going to um, an event in Texas, and uh, one year they were screaming about how awful the Z is because my listing, my lead, and then the next year they were in bed with the big Z. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, and um, you know, and and that's happening now with these i buyers and and other brokerages are kind of creating their own platform for these things. But you know, I, I don't understand why these agents that are with these offices that are, are partnering with, with these companies are not running out the door because it's clear to me that you are not their best interest. Yeah. D here's the thing that it's the one statistic that I point to, to, you know, just to tell agents how dumb it is for you to think of this as this is another tool on my tool belt. When I go to a listing appointment, that's, that's the little spiel, which no one has been able to make a constructive, rational argument for um, to me, but I'm open to it if someone wants to do it. Um, but, you know, when, you know, when I buyers in Central Florida, the top two over the last year have performed about, I think it was 1,700 and something closings on the seller side and 40 on the buy side, it tells you one thing very clearly they need a lot of real estate agents to get behind them because they don't know how to get the buyer side of the transaction done. And by companies getting in bed with the real estate companies getting in bed with them, all you're doing is teaching them and facilitating to them how to do the buyer side of the transaction, how to structure that. And it's just a bunch of dummies out there going to work for them thinking like, oh, this is going to be good. This is the future of the industry. Like, no, they are using you to figure out how to do this piece that they can't figure out. They just can't. Very talented so far at, the, at the being able to approach a, an unrepresented seller and buying the house from that unrepresented seller. They're very talented at that. Not so much at actually selling the home. They're relying on real estate agents to bring buyers to sell those homes in more than 99% of the time. So, you know, when companies are getting in bed with them, to me, the only winner is the iBuyer because the iBuyers, oh, the iBuyers absolutely trying to learn how to do that part that they can't figure out. They just cannot do it. They've tried to 
create partnership with real estate companies. They've tried to get other companies to list their homes. They've, they've tried it several different ways. But as we know in the industry, getting both sides of the transaction on a deal is complex. It's not a super easy thing to do to begin with, but they're, that's what they're trying to do. That's why they want to get real estate agents very close to their hip, I think. Yeah, I don't... I- you're probably right with that. Um, I definitely agree with we're teaching them, um, which is an absolute shame because it, it, they they do stand to really cripple our industry. And I, for one, um, in 10 years, don't want to find myself having to, you know, sit at a desk for Z or sit at a desk for Open Door like a Redfit agent and just be, you know, I'm agent number 46925. How can I help you? Yeah. No, that's not what I got into this for. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I say beyond beyond my personal feelings and my personal bias, because this is what I do for a living after all, I'm also very concerned that in 10 years, I will have to give them a call and accept what they give me as a purchase price for my house because the market is so influenced by them and they have such a share of market that the open market is basically controlled by them. So, you know, beyond what I would suffer as a as an industry professional, I, you know, I can go wait tables. I, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I'll be able to provide for my family so long as I'm alive and healthy. But the other concern is what they do to homeowners and home sellers. Like what's happening to home ownership, you know, which is the way that people build most wealth. And, you know, in this mm-hmm. country, most people build their wealth through having a home that they pay for for a long time and they build equity on. You know, what happens to that if this guy's control a significant, you know, share of the market? Well, we're, we'll be in trouble on that that end as well. Yeah. You know, it's it's pretty clear. Um, You'll be agent 469 living in the commune 3256. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of sad and it's really scary. Yeah, it can be. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for coming over. Um, we made it to 42 minutes. Wow. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's, it is. It's a big deal. And I um, only dropped two f bombs. Th- <laughs> you can drop a third one if you want to make. That's quite all right. <laughs> I, I'm working on it. Not um, really, but um, it, it's such a pleasure talking to you on the podcast. We talk very often, but I hadn't had you in here. Um, you're a, you're a person with the utmost integrity in this industry. Um, and you, can you tell people the name of your company and how they can reach you if they want to talk to you? Yeah, um, Lisa Jones with Vantage Point Realty. Uh, my cell is 352-536-4104. Feel free to text me or call me. You can email me um, or visit the, the uh, website for the company, vantagepointrealtyco.com. I know it's long ass, but I couldn't get what I wanted. And uh, <laughs> Lisa J O N Z at gmail.com. Uh, Keep it pretty simple. Keep it pretty easy. Keep it real. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Mario. Not bad. <laughs>